Hello everyone, my name is Brant Kudrowski and this Organic Chemistry Lab video covers an unknown organic solution experiment. This is the video for period two and it covers solute identification. This slide will recap what's going on in this experiment overall. You'll be given an unknown organic solution that you need to identify the solute and solvent for over the course of two lab periods. In the first lab period, which we did last time, we separated the solvent and solute by distillation. We identified the solvent by its boiling point, density relative to water, and IR spectroscopy. We identified the major solute's functional group by solubility tests and IR analysis. And we determined the solute's melting point if it was a solid or its boiling point if it was a liquid. Then we also prepared and submitted a solute sample for NMR spectroscopy. In the second lab period, you'll interpret your experimental proton NMR results, which will be emailed to you. You'll also be given a carbon-13 NMR spectrum and a mass spectrum to interpret to help finalize your unknown solute structure. Then you'll also look up the literature melting point or boiling point of your solute once you have a structure candidate and compare that to the experimental value that you acquired last time. Here's a recap of the unknown solution's information. The solution contains a solvent, and we identified that last period as either ether, dichloromethane, or tetrahydrofuran, THF, and a solute in about a four to one volume ratio. As a reminder, the solute will contain one of the following major functional groups, aldehyde, ketone, ester, carboxylic acid, amine, phenol, or alcohol, and we identified that last time by IR spectroscopy. It may also contain one or more of the following minor functional groups like chloride, bromide, ether, alkene, or aromatic ring. Those you may not yet know. Chlorine and bromine, for example, you'll likely need a mass spectrum to identify. The solute will also boil at least 30 degrees higher than the solvent, and that enabled us to separate the two by simple distillation. And your solute may be a solid or a liquid. Finally, your unknown solution has a code that should be written down in your notebook. Here are some learning objectives for the second period experiment. At the end of this experiment, you will learn to interpret the proton NMR spectrum of your unknown solute and assign the peaks in that spectrum with letters A, B, C, and so on to protons in the structure. You'll be able to interpret the carbon-13 NMR spectrum of your unknown solute and assign its peaks, capital A, capital B, capital C, and so on, to carbons in its structure. You'll be able to interpret the mass spectrum of your unknown solute and assign the molecular ion peak and the base peak to structures. You'll use solute solubility info, IR spectrum, proton NMR spectrum, and carbon-13 NMR spectrum, along with the mass spectrum, to identify the structure of your unknown solute. Then you'll search for your solute structure on the following website, pubchem.ncbi.nlm.nih.gov, to determine its name and its physical properties. Then you'll find its literature melting point or boiling point on that site and compare it to your experimental value, and hopefully they match pretty closely. Here are some tips for proton NMR solute interpretation. Your proton NMR data for your unknown solute that you prepared a sample for last time will be emailed to you either as a PDF image of your spectrum or as an NMR data file that can be opened and processed with the software program Topspin by Bruker Biospin. Topspin used to be covered in another video. You may also get both a PDF image and a data file that you can open. You need to locate any peaks in your proton NMR spectrum that are due to solvents and recognize that these are not part of your unknown solute. These come from peaks due to materials in the NMR solvent, like CHCl3, that's a singlet that appears at 7.28 part per million. Water is often also present as a broad singlet at about 1.55 parts per million. Then there could also be peaks from residual unknown solvent that are present. If your unknown solvent was ether, you might have ether peaks. If your solvent was dichloromethane, you might have a dichloromethane peak. Or tetrahydrofuran peaks if your unknown solvent was THF. On subsequent slides, I'll go through all of these and show you where those peaks show up. Once you've located all the solvent peaks that could possibly be in your spectrum, then you should assign the remaining peaks to your unknown solute. Here's a reference proton NMR spectrum of the NMR solvent CdCl3. Chloroform has the formula CHCl3, and deuterated chloroform is CdCl3, where the deuterium has replaced the hydrogen. Deuterium is a heavy isotope of hydrogen that has one more neutron. It's also invisible in the proton NMR spectrum, so if we had pure CdCl3, there would be no peaks in this proton NMR spectrum. However, it's not 100% deuterated. The bottle of deuterated chloroform that we have is 99.8% D. That means there's 0.2% of CHCl3, and that's what's giving rise to the peak at 7.28 part per million. Then in the CDCl3, there's often water present as well, and that's giving the peak at 1.54 parts per million in this spectrum. These two peaks could potentially be present in any proton NMR spectrum that was acquired experimentally using CDCl3 solvent. The size of these peaks depends on the concentration of the sample that you put in your NMR tube. If you have a very concentrated sample with a lot of solute, these residual peaks due to NMR solvent might be very small and you might not see them at all. But if you have a dilute sample, they're gonna be bigger. 
No matter what, you should always be on the lookout for these peaks to make sure that you know what they are and you're not confused by them. In addition to peaks from the NMR solvent, your unknown solute proton NMR spectrum may also contain peaks due to the unknown solvent, if you didn't completely remove it in the distillation and subsequent evaporation process. Here's a reference proton NMR spectrum for the ether solvent, and here are the assignments of the two signals in the spectrum. If you identified ether as your unknown solvent, you should definitely watch for these peaks in your proton NMR spectrum of your unknown solute. The reference proton NMR spectrum for CH2Cl2 dichloromethane solvent is shown here. It shows up as a singlet at 5.32 parts per million, due to the one unique type of proton that's present in this solvent. If you look very carefully, you can also see peaks due to residual CHCl3 and a little bit of water in this sample as well. Here's a reference proton NMR spectrum of the solvent THF, and here are its peak assignments. The two signals for THF are complicated and are what we call second order multiplets, which means that you can't figure out their splitting using the n plus 1 rule. The reasons for this are complicated and beyond the scope of this class. For this experiment, it's enough to know their location and their appearance and that they're distinctive for THF. So now on to data for the unknown solute. This is a proton NMR spectrum of the unknown solute associated with unknown FS90. This is the unknown solution that I'm featuring in all the videos for this experiment. This spectrum was acquired in chloroform D and integration values are shown both below the spectrum in numbers and also as integral traces above the peaks. And I have expansions of several multiplet regions so you can clearly see the splitting. There's a signal A, which I have shown here that's at about 4.1 parts per million. There's signal B, which is a singlet. Then there's signal C, which I have an expansion of, along with signal D, which is also shown as a blown up region. And then there's signal E, which is a big doublet. Integration values are shown below in red, and the red traces above each peak also represent the relative ratios of the protons. Remember, the integration values don't give you the exact number of protons, they give you the ratio of protons. When you receive proton NMR data for your unknown solute, you'll want to go through and label each one of the signals like I've done here with letter labels A, B, C, and so on. You'll need to figure out your unknown solute structure, draw its structure, include all the protons, and then label those protons with letter labels to assign them. If you're a little rusty on spectra interpretation, you may want to go back and watch some of my prior videos that cover interpretation of proton NMR, carbon NMR, mass spectrometry, and IR spectra. Now we'll move on and talk about carbon-13 NMR solute interpretation. A copy of your C13 NMR data for your solute will be available to you either as a PDF image posted on Canvas or as a PDF image sent to you by email. You should locate the three peaks at about 77 parts per million of equal intensity in your carbon-13 NMR spectrum due to the NMR solvent. And just realize that these are not part of your unknown solute, they're due to the NMR solvent. You should assign the remaining peaks in your unknown solutes carbon-13 NMR spectrum to carbons in your molecule. Here's a reference carbon-13 NMR spectrum of the solvent CDCl3. CDCl3 contains a carbon, so it's going to have a signal in the carbon NMR spectrum. It contains one carbon, and that carbon has a deuterium, which splits it into three equal-sized peaks. Here's an expansion showing the three peaks, and here are the three peaks in the full spectrum. The splitting rules for deuterium are different than the splitting rules for proton, and it's a topic for a more advanced class on NMR spectroscopy. For this experiment, it's enough to know that these three signals are associated with the NMR solvent, and it's important not to confuse them for carbons in your solute. Here's a carbon-13 NMR spectrum for the unknown solute FS90 that's featured in these demonstration videos for this experiment. A carbon NMR peak list will be provided. Here it is for this spectrum, where there are peaks I've labeled A through F. This is important for carbon-13 NMR spectra, where the peaks are very close together and it's hard to tell how many there are. You'll be able to look at the peak list and know for sure. Your carbon-13 NMR spectrum for your unknown solute will be organized similarly with a peak list. I'll label these peaks with capital letters in a way that's analogous to the way I labeled the proton NMR spectrum. When you figure out the structure of your unknown solute, you'll draw its structure and then draw capital A, B, C, and so on next to each one of the carbons to identify it and assign it. Now I'll move on and talk about solute mass spectrum interpretation. Mass spectrometry data for your unknown solute will be available to you either as a PDF image posted in Canvas or as a PDF image sent to you by email. When you get your unknown mass spectrum, you should locate the molecular ion and the base peaks in your spectrum and identify their structures. Remember, every peak in the mass spectrum is a cation or a radical cation, so when you draw your structures for those peaks, make sure that you show positive charges. Here's the mass spectrum of the unknown solute FS90. In this spectrum, the molecular ion is too weak to really observe, and when that molecular ion is too weak to see, we'll identify it for you. In this spectrum, it's at 130 mass to charge ratio. That's not something you could know on your own, so we provide you with that data. 
The base peak is the most abundant cation in the spectrum and it's set to a relative intensity of 100%. Those two peaks are ones you should identify for your report. The molecular ion tells you about the structure of the molecule as a whole, it's just lost one electron, and the base peak tells you the most abundant cation, which is probably the most stable cation. That fragment can be useful for figuring out the structure. Finally, we'll talk about solute melting point or boiling point analysis. You should search for your solute structure on PubChem. You could search by name or by structure and find its literature melting point if you have a solid or its literature boiling point if you have a liquid and then compare that value to your experimental value and see how well they match. Here's a video that shows the structure searching capabilities of PubChem. I'll scroll down here a little bit and then you can see the draw structure option. I'll click on that to bring up the drawing tool. There's a series of templates that you can use over on the left. I'll click benzene ring then click on the screen to draw a ring. I can draw bonds by pointing to the atom and clicking to sprout a bond and I'll do that again to create an ethyl group. Now I'll switch to the double bond drawing tool and I'll click on the structure to draw a carbon-carbon double bond. Now I'll change one of the atoms to an oxygen by clicking the O in the palette and then clicking where I want the oxygen to be. Now I'll search for this structure and what comes up is a name for a molecule called acetophenone. I'll click on that and it'll bring up the properties for this acetophenone molecule. You can see it has many different aliases. Acetophenone is just one name it's known as. It also has a cast number. 1-phenylethanone is another name for it. Methylphenylketone is yet another name for it. And so on. If I want to get to chemical and physical properties, I'll click on this tab over here on the right. Then I'll scroll down through the various properties to find boiling point, which is the first thing I'm looking for. Here you can see the entry for boiling point. There are entries that are listed in Fahrenheit and some that are in Celsius. The first entry has 760 millimeters of mercury listed after it, which is the pressure that this boiling point was acquired at, which is atmospheric pressure. If this were a different number, something other than 760, it would affect the boiling point. Lower pressures result in lower boiling points. Now I'll scroll down to get to melting point data for this molecule acetophenone. There are several entries in several different databases, but they mostly agree with each other and they're around 20 degrees Celsius. Finally, if you want to cite PubChem, you could just click this button and it brings up a whole bunch of different options for citation in different reference styles. I'll click MLA here to copy the MLA formatted reference to the clipboard. This concludes this last video on the unknown solution experiment. Best wishes identifying your unknown solute. If you found this video useful, check out the next one in the series or watch the prior video and consider subscribing to my YouTube channel. My name is Brant Kudrowski. Thanks for watching.